fascinating webinar series so far, and I'm really looking forward to today's talk. So today our speaker joining us is Dr. Thomas Fallen, who is an associate professor at Los Angeles Mission College, uh, where he teaches courses on modern and contemporary art, and he has published on a variety of things, including on Marcel Duchamp and Robert Rauschenberg, among many other things. And today he'll be talking about Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. And uh, I'm sure that there will be questions and they are very much encouraged. And just a reminder that uh, to post them in the Q&A is preferable uh, than in the chat. So in the Q&A and we will get to them at the end. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Tom. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Lauren. And uh, let me see, I'm gonna share my content my screen. Also, I wanna thank Stephen and Lauren uh, and Beth as well for inviting me to be part of this uh, Smart History lecture series. I'm just really thrilled to be part of it. And of course, everybody who signed up. So just give me one second, let me start this. Well, for some reason, <laughs> it's just my luck. It's, it seems to be taking its time starting. Well, while I'm trying to load this, um, let me just say I um, I teach. Um, so, as Lauren mentioned, I teach modern and contemporary art history classes, and I also do a Renaissance to modern survey. And so, in teaching this painting, uh, particularly for the the larger survey course, it's um, it's a really excellent introduction to modernist uh, abstraction, um, which began during like the post-impressionist period in the West and Europe, as artists start to migrate away from realism and in heavily symbolic subject matter. And this painting is also a really good uh, introduction to cubism. So again, I'm trying to figure out, okay, I think we got it. I'm sorry, my uh, share thing seems to not be working. Tom, would it be useful if I shared your PowerPoint from my end and you can just direct me when you want to advance the slides? Yes, let me just try one more time because I think something might have. Okay, so uh, live broadcast is in the stop. Do you, you have stopped screen sharing? Okay, right. I'm, I'm going to hit broadcast one more time and then if it doesn't work, yeah. Sorry about this. Start broadcast. Uh, this audit worked just like two seconds ago. Okay, it's working. Can you see my screen now? We can, and we can hear you just fine. Everything looks oh, good. Great, fantastic. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so um, as I say, I teach this, this painting in the context of different survey courses. We spend a little bit more time with it in a, um, a modern and contemporary survey. But as I say, from a Renaissance to modern class, it's a really excellent introduction to modernism in general. Um, and I um, have put up these four topics. These are sort of general topics that I think are really great um, ways to structure a discussion of this work. And they really make for great discussion points with students. Um, one of the questions I always ask is how and why does Picasso appropriate African art? And when we talk about African sculpture or mask in Picasso's works particularly, it's really important to point out that we're really talking about French colonies in Africa in the north and west part of the continent. Um, and so number two, it's what connection does this painting have, if any, to one of the first radically modern styles of the early 20th century, which is Cubism. And I'll come back to that. And then really, the, and this seems like a simple question, but this is really, I think, one of the most complex questions to still ask. And the question is, what is primitivism? What does it mean? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then lastly, of course, the, why the persistent focus on nude women in avant-garde art that we've studied so far? So these are the topics, this is the painting. And what I always do with students is I really want them to understand what we're looking at first, like let's study the object. So I really get them to look at the work. We'll start here. So what do we have? We have this painting of five nude female figures. Two of them, as you can see, have African masks on the right. Uh, there's a, what's most likely an Iberian head on the figure on the left. And then we have these two, uh, central figures. And then of course, there's that odd sort of still life arrangement at the bottom. You can see that uh, it's like a melon and some grapes. 
And it's really important to focus as, uh, as well as on the form. So, and this is one of the most difficult things I found with students, especially those who are new to art history. And I teach at a community college. So many of my students are new to art history is I really get them to look at form, the very makeup of the work, it's, it's physical materiality. Uh, you know, students tend to go straight to subject matter or content, or they wanna see symbolism. Um, so we really get focused on the painting itself, what is actually being uh, placed in front of us. And we see here that what Picasso's done is he splayed these very unidealized figures against a very shallow background. The entire painting, in fact, is comprised of these very angular shards and it's in this very limited color palette, uh, blues, flesh tones, clays mostly. And so the first thing to note is that this is really an attack upon the um, Renaissance picture plane. Um, this idea of the painting as a window onto an idealized world that depicts this uh, imaginary deep space. As you can see here in this comparison, uh, this painting by Giorgione with this reclining female nude. Um, that space is closed up in Picasso's work. Uh, the foreground and background in Picasso are only really distinguished by this kind of arbitrary contrast of color. There's not a traditional light source here. Um, and the women appear in this very distorted and angular form. Now, the other thing that's interesting to note about this is that the canvas, the size of it, it's square. Uh, it's nearly eight by eight foot. Uh, so that itself is tells us something. And it tells us that Picasso is thinking about every aspect of the picture. And he is really intent on radically reinventing um, the notion of what painting is. And this is 1907, keep in mind. So this is rather early. So we have these um, unidealized figures. We have this destruction of illusionistic space. We have the incorporation of African art, Iberian to some extent, which shifts the painting also to this kind of different visual or stylistic regist register within one singular painting. Um, another important thing to point out is that there's this shift here away from uh, classical subject matter, this idea of storytelling or narrative and art, uh, pictorial imagery, you could say. Or the, um, well, let's look at this work by uh, Jean-Baptiste Carpeau, uh, La Danse. The, this is a sculptural grouping that adorns the Palais Garnier. And this uh, sculpture depicts the dance of Bacchus from Greek mythology, it complements the Paris Opera House, the you know, this was this kind of Beaux-Arts jewel of the Second Empire uh, in France. Uh, and it, it tells us something about the Opera House. It's, uh, it's a kind of mythological narrative. Um, I should point out too, is that even though we understand this to be part of a classical tradition, the painting at its time, the sculpture, I'm sorry, at its time in uh, 1865 to 1869 was really viewed as this kind of unabashed naturalism. So it itself was rather scandalous. But my point here is that Picasso's painting has no overt symbolism. Now this marks a really important moment in modernism. There's a shift going on that has been occurring for a while from content to form. Now these of course may be or may not be uh, a depiction of women who were prostitutes from the Rue d'Avignon in Barcelona, but even that reading has been challenged. And the point is, is that that reading is not secure, that, that iconographic, reading of the imagery is not secure, such as it is in a work by Carpeau. Why is that? Modernist artists are not that interested in this kind of symbolic meaning. Their focus really is on form, style, um, and the meaning really is to be found there. And this is part of what you know, we acknowledge as a move to a sort of a formalist uh, idea of art during this period. Now, I wanna point out that Picasso was not alone in rejecting the academic system of painting, of course, there were immediate precedents. One of them is uh, Matisse's, I'm sorry, I've misspelled there as Maurice, it's Matisse, Le Bonheur de Vivre, 1905. Um, Picasso studied him carefully, knew of him. Matisse was an older artist. Picasso was very enamored of Matisse, envious of Matisse's position in the Parisian avant-garde circles at the time, um, and really wanted to outdo him. So what Matisse did for color 
as you can see here in this very famous example of Matisse's uh, work, he radically abstracts it. He separates color from de description. And what has often been said, what Matisse did for color, Picasso is going to do for form. He's going to abstract form. Now, this is where the volumetric abstractions of African art come into play here with Picasso. This is uh, um, a Vili uh, Congo figure. And on the right, you can see Picasso in his Martra studio. So Picasso discovered African art in Matisse's studio. He's immediately taken with it. And, and, and it was the abstract kind of, of African art that Picasso was, was looking at. And what he saw, along with what Matisse and Delain and Vlamink and a number of these other artists, some of them were associated with this earlier movement called Fauvism. What they saw was a way to achieve this play of space and form and volume. And this was highly prized by Western artists at that point, who were really looking for ways out of the staid academic classical salon tradition of uh, painting in this case, but of course this equally applies to sculpture. But these painters, were really fascinated by these, uh, these African objects, these sculptures that they were encountering. And the first um, uh, time that Picasso had actually seen something uh, where artists were really, well, these are African inspired nudes. Right? So this was a, a really important exhibition for Picasso. This uh, predates the beginning of Demoiselle d'Avignon. And it's these two paintings the first the, on the left by Matisse and then the work by Durain that really impacted Picasso. And it's at this point that he starts to work on Demoiselle d'Avignon using African art. Um, he also looked at a multitude of print sources. Uh, there's a work by an anthropologist, an illustrated book that was well known in Parisian circles at this point, uh, Leo Frobenius, uh, Congo Mass. Um, all of these become important pictorial sources for Picasso as he's really searching about, casting about for different ways, really out of a classical tradition um, and also in, in, in trying to reinvent, not the color of painting so much, this is why his palette's reduced, but the form. Um, Iberian art, head, uh, this head particularly, uh, was also influential. This was stolen from the Louvre and somehow it ended up in Picasso's possession. It's a really interesting story. But at any rate, Picasso had it for a brief period before it was returned. And you can see how this also gave Picasso uh, source material. Now, another really fascinating topic uh, with the Demoiselle d'Avignon is its relationship to Cubism, right? So Cubism was this really radical uh, early modern um, stylistic movement where that picture plane becomes comprised of very much like in Demoiselle d'Avignon, these uh, shattered planes that shift and there's no co coherent object in space in, in cubism to put it simply. But what's really interesting, I, and I, you can see here, I have this quote. This is a great quote from Anna Shave who wrote this interesting essay examining uh, these ideas about colonialism, uh, gender, race, um, and primitivism in Demoiselle d'Avignon. And uh, the fact that Demoiselle d'Avignon was, may or may not have been the first Cubist painting, there's, there's an interesting kind of back and forth when we talk about it. Um, one of the reasons, of course, is that there's no overt reference to African art and Cubist art. We don't talk about Cubism as a primitivist movement, one of these early modern primitive movements. Um, is it, as on the show says, the bastard child of African art? In other words, is the unacknowledged father uh, African art in Cubism. This raises, of course, other interesting questions about the, well, just the, the whole history of the avant-garde, um, its use of racialized imagery. We often see the presence of the colonial at the fringes, uh, in many cases, in, in the modest art. If we look at this work uh, on the right by Manet, we see that, that African maid who, was pretty much invisible for a long time. It's interesting. It wasn't, I, I don't mean actually invisible, but it was invisible to uh, scholars, critics for a very long time until, and that to me says something which really raises one of the bigger questions, I believe. When we talk about uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon, Cubism, this relationship to primitivism, is why is um, 
African art so unacknowledged as a presence within modernism. The, it, not just African art, but non-Western art in general. I, I'm sort of shorthanding the term primitivism with my example of Africa, but we have to look at other sources of non-Western art as well. And all of this really too is part of a legacy of the present moment when we think about uh, issues pertaining to, well, not just race, but also of course, gender. We can't not look at Damoiselle d'Avignon and not talk about the depiction of these women. Um, and often these two in this particular painting, especially the, they're, they're collapsed. We have this collapsing of these bodies of these very distorted, shattered, angular bodies of women with these African uh, uh, forms, African art forms grafted onto them. Um, and, you know, one of the most, it's interesting, one of the most renowned accounts of this painting by Leo Steinberg posits that this is a representation of Picasso's fear about women. This is an example of uh, I guess, uh, an iconographic reading being sort of imposed upon this painting. Um, this depiction of these women was seen to be an aggressive assault upon the viewer. The viewer assumed to be male. Um, their sexuality in that painting um, appears to be diseased. These are diseased prostitutes from the brothel of Avignon. This is really sort of a, I don't know, a hysterically male uh, uh, approach to this painting. What's really quite fascinating is that women art historians do not take that view. They often take a more, really more sober analysis of this painting and really look at it as a construction of uh, gender or construction of race, really looking at the collapse of these two. And again, what does this tell us about, as I always call it, the modernist project? Um, so, I'll conclude here and just having raised these kind of questions as discussion points and perhaps as further avenues of inquiry. Um, so I think I'll stop right now and we can go to question and answer. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Tom. Let's see, I'm going to um, pull up the Q&A. And if you want, you can stop sharing your screen and so we can see your, your face as we're responding. There we go. <laughs> but there we go. And let's see, I'm going to add myself here. And so we have a few questions that have come in. Thank you so much. That was really great. I mean, it, it's such a complex painting to distill, yeah, I feel like, into 15 minutes. There's so much I that know, we could talk about. So um, the first question is, is I think pretty straightforward and it's just, is the figure, the second from the left, wearing a corset possibly? Well, that's actually a great question. Um, this is one of those, those issues with this painting, right? It's that there's, there's so much uncertainty, but uh, there has been, I think, an argument that there's, there's elements of clothing in some of these figures. Um, but here's the thing, right? You you can ground that you can you can ground that in in, in some sort of visual analysis and make an argument, but you can't really claim it to be uh, the case. If you want to say that it's a corset, I think we, then we have to ask ourselves, well, why is it a corset? What is the uh, what is the point of making that a corset? If that's what he was going to do. I don't really think it is, to be honest with you. And I, I really think that the, the, you know, as I said, the subject of this painting is, of, well, of less interest to Picasso than the form, although we have to also ask why would he use such a uh, scandalous uh, subject, right? Why would he use such these nude women, these African masks? It's, it's a really theatrical, I think, approach to, well, it really places this whole idea of the, uh, the non-Western at the heart of, of modernism in a very you know, upfront way. But corsets, um, I don't know, interesting question. Could be. <laughs> there's no actual I like it. There's, answer there's, to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is, no, I, and I think that that's a, that's actually a, that somehow perfectly encapsulates uh, Picasso in this painting for me. It really does. Um, yeah. So we have another question that I think you you it was asked I think slightly before you were talking about it, but I think it would be great if you wanted to use this as an opportunity to expand and it's it's you know how is it okay for Picasso to appropriate and objectify imagery from African art when he himself right. was not African 
And obviously, the idea being that if you were to paint this today, you know, a white man, it would be considered a horrendous violation. And so maybe you could expand right. on that a little bit. Yes. Well, yes, that is really the key issue here of this painting. The fact that he had uh, the access to be able to do that, that the fact that he uh, felt that he could. Um, but is it okay to do that? I mean, I... In, so in classroom discussions, I, I, I raise this question with my students and I always talk about, well, colonialism, appropriation, um, and is it okay for uh, Western artists to copy non-Western culture and incorporate it into their work and then claim some sort of sense of originality to that, which is what was the case with Cubism? And Picasso really disavowed any kind of real knowledge of African art or awareness of it. He downplayed its significance. Um, in years, many years after the painting um, was, was made. Um, but ethically, it, it, it's problematic. I mean, I, pr I think it's, it's a problematic, but I think it's something that's really important to talk about. Um, Picasso was working at a period and, um, and in a place where those things were much more normalized. And one of the questions I like to ask my students is, um, do you think that this is could we call this painting the cultural face of colonialism? Does this justify in some way the colonial enterprise uh, at that time? Um, there's been interesting arguments. Uh, well, Patricia Leighton has wrote a great essay uh, where she makes this argument that it's an anti-colonial painting because he's trying to turn this uh, idea of the, the so-called primitive against itself within this painting. Um, there's, um, I mean, there's lots of literature describing th this painting. I, it's a, well, it's a really kind of rich painting in that way because it really sparks this debate. But I think it has, again, there's a lot of um, uh, contemporary relevance for these, these discussions also. We talk about you know, what is globalism now um, and how does this relate to uh, primitivism. Um, but it, in short, no, I think it's very problematic. I don't think artists can freely do that today. But I've had students who would respond when I try to uh, uh, position it in such a way that, you know, it's a little bit problematic, right, for this artist to sort of steal African art and then claim that it's his or he didn't know he was doing it or it's original. Um, or he's changed it in some way. No, it's very problematic. One of the ways I think that Western artists um, address this issue was to, uh, and critics would, would, would essentially to say that Western artists, and here's where you get to the heart of the problem. Western artists recognize in these uh, very, you know, the volumetric abstraction of African art, something that they themselves do not see. And this is really what primitivism is, right? It's, there's an, an assumption of a, a cultural superiority that's already built in that relationship. And so no, I think it's a, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, and I think that's a really important point that you just made at the end there, talking about uh, primitivism and, and how that that already built into that is this sense of superiority. So um, well, we have a lot of other questions, in fact. Okay. So I'm just going to I'm going to keep fielding them. I think some are pretty straightforward, but but another one is um, Picasso's own psychosexual anxiety is often seen as part of the story here. And so, what are your views on that? Well. My views is that um, I think for some reason, this is what I've never understood. People love to talk about Picasso's sex life, right? And how it like it um, plays into his painting. People don't want to talk about Rauschenberg's sex life and how that affects his artwork. But I, I really don't like biographical readings of art. This is just my training. I'm sort of anti-biographical. Um, <laughs> so I know that, well, the most famous reading, I, well, William Rubin has written about Picasso's work as a expression of some sort of sexual trauma. Um, and Leo Steinberg, of course, wrote the famous essay, The Philosophical Brothel. Um, I'm sure that there's an actual aspect of that. I mean, Picasso was, you know, let's face it, he was pretty much a straight up misogynist, right? Can I say that in <laughs> smart history? Um, he, but he had very, he also had probably typical, um, views about race of uh, people of his time, right? So they were um, uh, not as enlightened perhaps as, as, as people would ultimately become. Um, but in terms of the sexual trauma and anxiety, yeah, I mean, I, obviously you could see that, but again, you know, the, one of the, the, I think the point I try to make in my talk is that this is how men generally view this painting, like straight men, I should also point out. 
women uh, tend to view the painting a little bit differently. So um, it's always important to think about who's viewing the painting, who's the assumed viewer as well. Um, but did, that's, a, that's a great did, point. Did uh, Picasso have sexual trauma? Probably. Does it have much to do with his art? It might be, it's an element. I'm sure like everything is an element of what one does. Is it the most important part of this painting? To me, it's not. I, yeah, I think that, I, I mean, I tend to agree with that, but you know, that, that goes back to our uh, Bruin life. Uh, so you actually just, you touched on another question that, so I'm, I'm gonna skip around in the order of questions and it's, you know, could you, could you just expand more about the way female art historians have tended to view the way Picasso and these um, females and so how this departs, you know, from the tradition of the male gaze. I think there was some interest in, in maybe talking more about that. Oh yeah, well, there's this there's, there's, there's great stuff there. Well, first of all, so again, I, one of the best essays on this painting uh, is by Anna Shave, I think. Um, and she really does address uh, the, the way that Picasso sort of views gender. And you have to also look at the, in this painting, there's, you can't really separate the, the, the gendered image from the racialized image. So he, he collapses those two. And um, I think, um, I think as I mentioned in my talk, I, I, I believe that feminist analysis, let's say, of Demoiselle Devignon really looks at this from a larger cultural historical perspective. Uh, what does this say about uh, women at that time? What, uh, what does this say about the tradition of the use of women as these kinds of sites of experimentation by avant-garde artists? Um, and in this, so that would really be, a, 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 if I understand the question correctly, a more tr like a, a more feminist reading of the painting to really look at it as a construction of ideas about gender that might be just fears, anxieties, fantasies. So that's the more interesting question that Picasso have sexual trauma to me to kind of go back to the early question. It's really, how is this painting a reflection of or a construction of certain ideas about female sexuality? So that's really the the topic that I think uh, feminist analysis of this painting takes up, and it's a fascinating one. I think it's an important one. Yeah, I think that's such an important distinction too to make for students in the classroom, right? That mm -hmm. that how this has been interpreted, even through that lens, is really important to be mindful of. So that's that's a good reminder when we teach and when this. We, um, and, and when so, and when we look at it as simply a reflection of Picasso's own view, what we're doing is we're essentially uh, removing this larger context, which is this context of a very patriarchal culture, and then also the context in which women are part of this kind of, as I said, avant-garde experimentation, sort of focuses so narrowly on a sort of a biographical Picasso and his own relationships and uh, lovers, etc., is not to see this other aspect, which again is the bigger, larger, I think more important problematic here to look at. Absolutely. Uh, and I think on that note, a, a fairly straightforward, but somehow not simple question. And that is, uh, is this, do you think this is Picasso's most important work? Oh, interesting. It's funny, because I was thinking about that. And when I was, there's a, there's an, actually a new book that's just come out of this painting. That's kind of an interesting, another new take on this um, by um, um, uh, Suzanne preston Blier. And I always think, why is this painting the such a focus? And part of it has to do with, okay, so this is, this is my sort of cynical understanding in some extent of culture and how it works and the institutionalization or the canonization of art. The, it's MoMA's painting. MoMA owns this painting. And so, and MoMA writes art history or did for a long time. So MoMA is going to, of course, this is the jewel of the, the collection of MoMA. It's the prized jewel. So yeah, I think there's ways in which, you know, that aspect, you have to look at the institutionalization of it and how that has now become the most important early modernist painting. There's one, um, I read this somewhere a long time ago, there's a, another Picasso, uh, I think it's in the Hermitage collection that you could equally and arguably say is the first like Picasso sort of African inspired, for lack of a better term or phrase, um, painting. It has a lot to do with, I think, um, the canon, right? And it's another, that's a, I think that's actually a great question because it, it's always important. I always try to get students to, to think about, you know, the canon. Why do certain works count as important? What makes them important um, and what doesn't? But 
uh, in the same point, so at the same time, I want to say that it's a great example of this shift. So it's it's a pretty important painting, ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> it's very diplomatic. But I, but I yeah, think your I'm point about canon, form, canon formation is really important, especially for students in a survey who are often getting, you know, told a certain version, say, in a textbook versus somewhere else right. and, and keeping those things in mind. And I think we've been seeing a lot of these uh, webinars have been repeatedly coming back to that about like, why do we value this over, say, something else? And so I, I'm glad that that right. came up as a, as a question. And uh, a we have some more and, and I okay. I would technically we're we're at time, but we have a couple more great questions if you're willing to, to answer yeah, sure. them and stay on longer. Um, Absolutely. One is about the preparatory sketches. And so why maybe you don't bring them in or, you know, don't bring them in into your survey or maybe just for this talk, uh, which, you know, maybe propose a narrative between life and death. What was this last part of that question? It was uh, why discount the preparatory sketches, which have proposed a narrative between life and death. Uh, well, I, yeah, so it, I actually do talk about some of those preparatory sketches when I teach this. I didn't for this talk because it really just had to do with the timing, 15 minutes. Um, the other thing is, is that there are so many of these preparatory sketches and I think they discovered a trove of them not so long ago. Um, it's, uh, difficult uh, to, I think, sort of just address the, the, the mass of them there are. But yes, I know it does, it tends to document the, the kind of stages um, in making this painting. I think it's because he went through so many different kinds of um, uh, sort of approaches that it's really hard to uh, pinpoint one sketch over the other as uh, more or less significant. Um, and I don't know if I, I guess I could just say it's, it's well important to look at, is it necessary to um, determining sort of the, the meaning of the painting? I feel like that, that kind of approach really leads to this kind of treasure hunt for the, the real meaning of the painting as if there is just one real meaning. It's another avenue of investigation, I guess you could say. I don't tend to emphasize that so much because again, I really like to use this painting as a way to get my students to stop thinking about subject matter, symbolism, uh, and really focus on the formal aspect. And so I do uh, draw attention to the sketches as part of a sort of formal experimentation. But um, as for the life and death um, the symbolism, I mean, again, that's a um, yet one of many other, I guess you could say iconographic uh, um, routes one could take for sure, but it's not one that I generally address. Yeah, well, yes, we can. In a survey, we, we have to make choices, right? Um, right. Uh, a couple simple questions in, uh, that I imagine you can address are, you know, has there been scholarship done just on the fruit uh, placed in the painting? Uh, yes, there has been. Um, and I think some of the ideas that come up of that and somebody, if they know more about this, they can jump in. But one of the things I, I recall that has been, that has come up with that, that uh, piece of fruit is that Picasso's kind of acknowledging, it's kind of like with the square of the canvas, he's kind of acknowledging the irrelevance of uh, genre and subject matter. Because, you know, if you think about it, Cubism um, is a movement where the genre, the, 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 well, the genre is irrelevant in Cubism, right? It can be a still life, it can be a portrait. Everything is really just an excuse to abstract uh, and reinvent uh, the pictorial language of painting. So I think to me, what the, 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 that jar of fruit, um, it, it could be that. There's another, I think, um, theory that it has to do with sexual symbolism, going back to the idea of the painting as a representation of some sort of sexual trauma. Um, it's an acknowledgement really of a, it's kind of like a, an art about art. It's an acknowledgement of the, the, the sort of the practice of painting itself. Um, there are multiple and interesting theories to this. That's, uh, that's, a, that's very interesting. My students always want to know about the fruit and-, and Yeah, and, oh, and they do, yeah. Them. Mine tend not um, to look at it. Oh, really? <laughs> that's the first thing they, they see. Um, 
So I, I, real, I realize we have some other questions and, and comments. And so I think I'll, I'll just have, uh, I'll ask one more. And then hopefully if people still have comments, they can bring them uh, to the Facebook group just for the sake of time. Um, but the, the last question I'll ask that I think could be useful is, you know, someone asked, why do you suppose that there's only, only two of the women are wearing masks and well, that's actually a great question. In fact, you know, I actually, I just wrote a book review of this, uh, of the, this Preston Blier book, and I actually brought that issue up. And I, well, I didn't really bring it up as an issue. I, I think I just described the other figures as mask-like. So I think that's a really excellent observation. And I do believe that it's true. I, uh, they're, they're, well, but three of the figures are obviously, I mean, their heads are obviously um, juxtaposed, right? They're radically transformed. Those two figures in the center uh, there's a, there's a, there's a seamless transition from head to body, but they do appear mask-like. Yes, I agree. I think there uh, there's no individual personality that's uh, given to these figures, which is you know another interesting point to think about. Why is that? These are almost sort of masked uh, uh, figures entirety. Yeah. Yeah, this has been really great time. I think, uh, if anything, I, I feel like this has been a great opportunity to model how many questions are prompted by this one painting, right? And that by answering right. them, it opens up a host of other questions. And I think that's really good for our students to see. So thank you so much for uh, having this conversation that leading us through this painting. And um, for anyone whose question we didn't get to, please bring them to the Facebook group. I'm sure that Tom would be happy to answer more there. And um, we will post this up on YouTube soon enough. So thank you, Tom. And thank you everyone Absolutely. else for attending. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Tom. <laughs> thank you.